All the Young Dudes, Sirius's Perspective by Roller Coaster Words. Chapter 22, Second Year, The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. By the time dinner ended, Sirius was feeling much more like himself. James was telling a story that made Peter laugh so hard that he snorted pumpkin juice out of his nose, which sent all of the boys into hysterics. Sirius could almost forget that his little brother was sitting just a few feet away. Almost. So Reg had been sorted into Slytherin. Fine. It was all over and done, and Sirius told himself firmly that there was no changing it now, so there was really no use dwelling on it, or trying to unpack the tangled snarl of emotions that had created in his chest. Or trying to unpack the tangled snarl of emotions it had created in his chest. Instead, he decided to do what he did best, find a distraction. Luckily, he already knew what it would be. Over the summer... Sirius had had a much easier time reaching Andromedia. She was able to send mail directly to the Potters, instead of using the much slower Muggle post. Hoping to take advantage of the situation, Sirius had begged her to send him some more Muggle music. As his favourite cousin, she had, of course, obliged. Sirius had no way of knowing, when the flat brown package showed up at the Potter's doorstep, that his life was about to change. He didn't realise as he tore off the paper that what he held in his hands was not a simple record, but a door to an entirely new world. He didn't think, as he set the needle on the record player, that the entire course of his future would irrevocably change. It was unlike anything he had ever heard. The first song took his breath away, the second gave it back. He was transported, body glued to the carpet as his soul dripped up and down with the music. Sirius was sure there must be some sort of magic embedded into the sound. David Bowie, that was the name of the artist. He stared at the picture on the album cover. Bowie stood with his leg hitched up and a guitar slung over his shoulder, clothed in an electric blue jumpsuit that was unbuttoned nearly to his waist. He was the coolest person Sirius had ever seen. His heart did a funny little flip looking at him. He begged Andromedia to send him any and all things Bowie, she obliged, passing along a poster and some magazines and promising to pick up his other albums when she could. Sirius slipped through the pictures of the rock star, awestruck. He was unlike anyone, striking and alien and so bloody cool. James and Peter didn't get it, of course. Sirius had all but given up on converting them. They clearly lacked any sense of taste when it came to the finer things in life. James only had room for Quidditch in his brain, and Peter was entirely focused on James. But Remus, Sirius had been looking forward to the moment when they both got back at Hogwarts and could listen to the album together, knowing that Remus would understand. But Lupin shook him off after dinner, mumbling something about the hospital wing and hurrying away. Sirius frowned at his retreating form, mentally counting the days. But it wasn't the full moon tonight. Still... He knew better than to question Remus about anything having to do with his mysterious illness and returned sulkily back to the dorm to wait. As he set up his record player, James shot him a look. Oh, not this again, he moaned. You've already made us listen to that stardust bloke a million times this summer. Yeah, but Remus hasn't heard it, Sirius shot back, lying out his new albums on his bed. James sat up. Where is Remus? Hospital wing? Huh, he's sick quite a lot, isn't he? Sirius turned and was a bit alarmed to find a pensive expression on James's face. He tried to brush it off, saying quickly, Bet you'd be sick too if you had to spend the whole summer around muggles. James chuckled. <laughs> yeah, suppose so. He let it drop, turning to Peter, who wanted to play chess. Sirius breathed a sigh of relief. When Remus finally returned to the dorm, Sirius sat up excited. Lupin! he exclaimed. You have to hear this. Thank Merlin you're here, James groaned, as he finished his game with Peter and was flipping through the Quidditch magazine on his bed. He's been banging on about that muggle singer all summer. He's not a muggle, Sirius insisted, irritated. He has to be a wizard. Has to be. You should see the clothes he wears. Remus crossed the room and looked down curiously at the record player, picking it up. A small smile crossed his lips. 
Oh, Bowie. Yeah, I like him. He's not a wizard, though. Sirius deflated a bit. He'd been excited to introduce Remus to the music. But of course he'd already heard it, living with muggles all summer. Catching his expression, Remus said quickly, I've heard Starman a lot on the radio, but no one at St. Eddie's has the album. Sirius perked up again. Starman was good, but Remus was going to blow away when he heard the rest of the record. He eagerly fixed the needle in place, ignoring James's long-suffering sigh. Their friend pointedly left the room, magazine under his arm, but Sirius kept his eyes on Remus. He wanted to see his face as he heard the music for the first time. The slow, airy drumbeat of five years began, and Remus got comfortable on the edge of the bed, closing his eyes to listen. Sirius watched his friend's face greedily. An awestruck smile tugged at his lips with the crescendo until Bowie was shouting, As the song ended, fading out in a chaotic swirl of violins, Remus opened his eyes and met Sirius's gaze, and they just grinned at each other and didn't say anything at all. Once the closing bars of Rock and Roll Suicide were reverberating, Sirius lifted the needle and moved it back. Listen to Suffragette City again. That's my favourite. It was one of the bouncier tracks, with a gritty guitar and an upbeat tune that made them nod their heads and tap their feet. Remus said that he liked Moon Age Daydream the best, which Sirius thought made sense. It was kind of brash and aggressive, but then resolved in a soulful ballad. They played it all the way through again, then re-listened to their favourites, and by the time it was almost dinner, the boys sat cross-legged on the bed, scouring the album notes. Maybe he is a wizard, Remus murmured, smiling. He's not like a normal muggle. Told you, Sirius grinned, delighted that someone agreed with him. I'm going to get more, too. All of his albums. T-Rex had a new one, Remus said. Slider. Cool. I wish Mrs. Potter had let us leave Diagon Alley. I even got muggle money from Gringotts. What's Diagon Alley? Remus asked after a moment. Sirius blinked. It hadn't even occurred to him that someone might not even know what Diagon Alley was. Bloody hell, Lupin, he tutted. It's a wizarding street in London. Muggles can't get to it. Like Hogsmeade. Oh, right, Remus said, turning back to the album notes. Where do you get all your stuff? What stuff? School stuff. Your books and your clothes. Your robes. Sirius glanced down, trailing off as he realised just how worn Remus's clothes were. The cuffs of his robes were badly frayed. Or Perga Black would have had an aneurysm if her sons ever stepped outside wearing something so shabby. Second hand, I think, Remus shrugged. Dumbledore sends him. Don't know how to get to a wizarding street. I'm not allowed into London alone. Next summer, Sirius said firmly, you have to come to James's place and stay, and we can go to Diagon Alley. You'll love it. You know I can't, Sirius mumbled, looking away. We'll sort it. Sirius insisted. Talk to Dumbledore. McGonagall, the Minister of Magic, if we have to. Yeah, great. Thanks, Black. Remus smiled, but it didn't quite reach his eyes. Chapter 23. Second Year. Brotherhood. Sirius woke up happy the next morning, with Suffragette City still stuck in his head. He hummed as he brushed his teeth and got dressed, which made James groan and throw his pillow over his head. As they headed down to the Great Hall for breakfast, Sirius teased, Just you wait, Potter. One of these days I'll make you see the light. You can't live in ignorance forever. James rolled his eyes, taking a seat at the long table. Music's just music. It's not like this Bowie guy is doing anything that hasn't been done before. Oh, how you wound me! Sirius slumped dramatically onto Remus's shoulder. At least I have you, Lupin. Honestly, what are we going to do with these two? Remus only smiled and shrugged in answer, his mouth already full of food. James was about to offer a retort when the post arrived, owls swooping to drop their letters and packages. 
Sirius tried not to look, but he really couldn't help it. Over James's shoulder, a brand new eagle owl was settling onto the Slytherin table, right in front of Regulus. Of all people, his brother had chosen to sit next to Snape. The older boy picked up the letter that the owl had dropped, unfolding it quickly over Reggie's protests. As he started to read, a delighted grin spread across his features, and he looked up at Sirius with a mean glint in his eye. Wow, Regulus, your parents are really proud, Snape drawled, speaking just loud enough to ensure that Sirius and his friends could hear. Listen to this. Our dearest son, we are so pleased to hear the results of your sorting. The entire family commends you on upholding noble traditions. Our congratulations are in order. Regulus was blushing, trying to snatch the letter away from Snape, but the second year kept stubbornly reading. It was clear that the owl was a reward for Reg, since he had gotten into the right house. Every word that came from Snape's mouth was a barb, a stinging reminder to Sirius that, unlike his brother, he was still the family disappointment. His face felt hot. He stared down at his porridge, not wanting to let the Slytherin see the effect his parents' words had on him. I don't care, he reminded himself furiously. But shame was a fist around his throat, making it impossible to eat. Didn't your parents confiscate your owl again? Peter asked bluntly. Reg had managed to snatch the letter back now, but Snape and his friends were still snickering, and the owl was still perched imperiously on the Slytherin table. Sirius gave a sharp nod and muttered, Said I can have it back when I remember my duty to the family and start acting like a true black. I don't care. I didn't need an owl. He felt sick, angry, he wanted to get the hell out of the hall, away from Snape and his stupid laughing friends. What exactly is your family duty again? James mu mused loudly, making sure the Slytherins could hear him. Go around with creeps like Snivellus and Mulspa. Marry your cousin? Despite his embarrassment, Sirius smiled, eternally grateful for James Potter. Oh yeah he replied, matching his friend's tone. Inbreeding and creeping are key aspects of the noble heritage. And picking on kids smaller than me, of course. Cheating, lying and cursing my way to power. Snape and the other laughing Slytherins had quietened down now and were narrowing their eyes at the hurtled insults. Regulus was red-faced. Brown nodded as he listened. Sirius couldn't tell if his expression was angry or hurt and he decided he didn't care. "'Well, mate, sorry to break it to you,' James said, not sounding the least bit sorry. "'But it doesn't sound like you're a black at all.' Now Sirius was beginning to enjoy the performance, and he brought his hands to his face to mimic surprise. "'Goodness!' he gasped. "'What on earth am I?' "'Why, it's obvious,' James smiled impishly. "'You're a marauder!' Sirius laughed as did most of the Gryffindors sitting nearby, which lifted his spirits considerably. What did it really matter if their parents sent Regulus a new owl? Who cares? This is Hogwarts. His parents couldn't hurt him here. Come on, Snape steered. We better get away from all this filth if we want to keep our breakfast down. This sent Sirius and James into near hysterics. It was too funny to hear Severus commenting on filth when his hair was so greasy it looked like he had washed it with oil. Snape stuck his long nose into the air and attempted a dignified exit. He didn't quite succeed, but Mulsifer and a new first year, Barty Crouch, followed all the same. Regulus hung back. He glanced nervously at his new friends, then at Sirius. The owl sat preening on his elbow, condescending and unblinking. Sirius waited to see what his brother would do, hoping desperately that Reg would walk over, even as he cringed from the thought. Sure enough, his brother edged towards him. You can borrow it, if you want, Regulus said quietly. I never asked her to send me anything, but you know what she's like. <laughs> yeah, Sirius snorted. I know. 
They hadn't spoken since their spat on the train the previous day, but Regulus no longer seemed annoyed with him. The curled lip, the petty disdain, it had all disappeared from his features, like shredding, like shedding a cloak. He looked more like himself again, staring at Sirius with wide eyes that were a little unsure, a little hopeful. Something loosened in his chest, dangerously. Something loosened in his chest, dangerously. Sirius realised that he missed his brother, that he'd been missing him for a long time. Regulus opened his mouth to speak. Look, I'm sorry, OK? I knew I'd end up in Slith... Before he could finish the sentence, Sirius leapt to his feet. I don't want your owl, he bit out. The words clipped and awkward. If I need to send a letter, I'll borrow James's. He pushed past Reg, needing to get away. He was barely aware of his friends following as he hurried out the hall, acid bubbling in his heart. His brother's words echoed in his head. You knew I'd end up in. Sirius felt very stupid and very small. Reg had said it like it was obvious, like they'd both known all along. But Sirius realised, as he stormed back to the common room, that it wasn't true. Because the truth was, despite all he'd told James on the train, Sirius had honestly believed that his brother would end up in Gryffindor. With him. Sirius didn't speak to Regulus again for the next week. Instead, as they waited for lessons to start, he played The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and The Spiders from Mars on repeat. Eventually, even James was humming tunelessly along with Tuboe. In exchange, James had them out on the Quidditch pitch every day, running the same drills they'd been doing all summer. He was a maniac on a broom, zipping around like he controlled the air itself, and anyone could see that he was basically guaranteed a spot on the team with that kind of skill. Still, Sirius didn't mind the extra practice. He adored flying, even when it was a bit annoying having James shouting at him every few minutes to stay on task. It wasn't like they were actually in the middle of a game, and hitting bludgers over and over again got a bit boring after a while when there were no immediate stakes. So despite James's admonishments, Sirius continued to loop and swerve, trying to impress Remus from where he watched them on the stands. Lupin had managed to avoid getting roped into the Quidditch frenzy. He was the only one who could go toe-to-toe with James when it came to pure, unadulterated stubbornness. He flatly refused to join in with the drills, although he still kept them company on the field, where he would sit in the stalls and read. In fact, it was almost impossible to find Remus anywhere without his nose in a book. Even before lessons, he wasted all his time doing homework. On Saturday afternoon, Sirius tagged along to the library. Peter and and James were playing chess in the common room, only to discover that Remus was doing extra reading for their subjects. He had already finished the set text from History of Magic, and he claimed he wanted to learn more about the medieval acclimists. Come on, Lupin, you aren't going to have any time for maraudering if you keep up at this pace. Remus shrugged absentmindedly, eyes flicking over titles. You'll be fine. But we need you, Sirius slung an arm over his friend's shoulder, trying to get his attention. Remus glanced around before responding with a wary smile. You know, you're the one who gave me the reading spell. I know, Sirius groaned again. I've created a monster. No amount of complaining could sway Remus, however. He was just as eager once lessons started. He was just as eager. He was just as eager once lessons started, answering questions in class and completing homework immediately, and completing homework immediately after it was assigned. It was a complete 180 from the previous year. Sirius and James, who had both grown used to competing with each other, suddenly found that they had to keep on their toes and make sure they didn't fall behind Remus. Poor Peter was left floundering, but Sirius couldn't bring himself to feel bad about that. All in all, there was so much to do that he hardly had time to even think about his brother. Sirius threw himself into schoolwork in Quidditch and spent spare time planning out pranks. If he ever found himself with nothing to do and needed to drown out his thoughts, Bowie was there, and on nights where he lay awake, unable to sleep, he had James. 
When he'd stayed at the Potters over the summer, Sirius had been given his own room, but he'd ended up falling asleep in James's bed most nights, talking until they were so exhausted that they couldn't keep their eyes open. It had become an almost it had almost become a routine. And so at Hogwarts it didn't feel unusual at all for Sirius to crawl over into James's bed. They would draw the curtains and whisper about their ideas for spell combinations, or creative dung bomb usage, or quidditch strategies, try to keep quiet while the other boys slept. Near the end of September, though, Sirius was a bit surprised to find James climbing into his bed. He scooted over quickly. It wasn't like there was a rule, but usually Sirius was the one going to James, not the other way around. It was, the la- it was two days after the full moon, but for some reason Remus was still in the hospital wing, so they only had to worry about waking Peter. Unfortunately, that was exactly what James had come to talk about. Lupin isn't back yet, he said, getting straight to the point. Sirius yawned. He's been feeling sick, probably still in the hospital wing. Remus had, in fact, spent the days leading up to the full moon telling his friends that he wasn't feeling well. It wasn't a fantastic lie, as he seemed to have loads more energy than usual, but Sirius was glad to have something to fall back on. Yeah, but don't you think it's strange that Madame Pomfrey won't let us see him? Sirius shrugged. Maybe it's contagious. Yeah, I guess, but don't you think he goes to the hospital wing quite a lot? A pause, then... No? Really? James had clearly been expecting agreement. Luckily, his overabundance of confidence led him to attribute the discrepancy to his own attentiveness, and he didn't seem to notice how nervous his friend was. He's in there once a month, and it's always on the full moon. Sirius's heart sank. Oh no. So? James leaned in, whispering fervently. I think Remus is a werewolf. For a moment, Sirius didn't know what to say. Of course, he did his best to cast doubt on the theory, but that only led James to dig his heels in. He became more and more certain as he laid out all the evidence, piece by piece. After a while, there was nothing that Sirius could do but ask what James intended to do about this discovery. The question seemed to catch his friend off guard. I don't know, he frowned, thinking. Suppose we should talk to him about it. Sirius blanched. Ask him about it? Why? So we know if it's true or not, James said, as if it was obvious. And uh, if there's, you know, anything we need to do about it. What do you mean by that? Well, you know... James shifted uncomfortably. In case it's dangerous. Sirius snorted. (laughs) If Remus was dangerous, Dumbledore wouldn't have let him into Hogwarts. Now James was frowning again, thinking. You reckon Dumbledore knows, then? Of course he does. Lupin's in the hospital wing every month. Reckon the nurse knows about it, too, and probably McGonagall. Not sure about the rest of the staff, though. James nodded thoughtfully. Yeah, I suppose you're right. It's not as if he would keep a secret from Dumbledore. Exactly, so he's not dangerous. And you don't need to say anything. Sirius leaned forwards, excited to be making progress, but James shook his head. We still need to talk to him about it. James, Sirius groaned. If you were a werewolf and you were keeping a secret and your friends figured it out, then would you really want them to confront you about it? James looked baffled. Why would I keep a secret from my friends? Despite his best efforts, Sirius failed to dissuade James from his plan to confront Remus. To make matters worse, the other boys insisted on telling Peter everything they'd talked about in the morning. You can't just go around telling everyone, Sirius hissed. You don't even know if it's true. I'm not telling everyone, it's Pete. It was hard to stay mad at James Potter, but on that morning, Sirius did a pretty good job. He gave James the cold shoulder during breakfast, barely speaking to the boy. When he left to go to class, he made up an excuse about forgetting his defence against the dark arts essay in their room. 
As the other boys made their way to Transfiguration, Sirius ran as fast as he could to the hospital wing. He had to warn Remus. When he arrived, Madame Pomfrey informed him that Remus had just been released, although she'd instructed him not to go to class. Sirius thanked her, then hurried all the way back to the Gryffindor Tower. He was panting and out of breath by the time he climbed the stairs and reached their room. The curtains were drawn on Remus's bed, fluttering in the breeze from the open window. Sirius rushed over, ripping them back. Lupin! He was lying peacefully with his eyes closed, curled on his side. As the light flooded over his face, he groaned and shielded his eyes. Oh, what? Sorry, Sirius said, rubbing his arm. He'd been in such a frantic rush to find Remus, but now that he was actually standing in front of his friend, thinking about what he had to say, the words lodged in his throat. What is it? Sirius took a deep breath. Remus, I have to tell you something. They stared at each other for a few moments, and Sirius tried to think of how he could say it. Remus sighed, still half laying on the bed. Well? It's James. The words burst out of him. He... He wants to talk to you. What? It's... Blimey, it's hard to say, Lupin. What are you on about? He knows. James knows, and he wants to confront you. Remus sat up quickly, eyes widening. He... He what? Knows what? About your... Do you know where you go every full moon? Remus's face went white. For a moment, he only stared at Sirius, horrified, and then something clicked. You knew? I knew. How long? Since last Christmas. I I didn't want to say anything. I didn't want to make it harder for you. Remus just continued to stare as he shook his head. Frustrated, he tried to explain. But James worked it out too, the lanky idiot. And now he's decided we all need to confront you about it. I'm really sorry. I tried to get him off it. But you know how pig-headed he is. Yeah, Remus said in a strangled voice, leaning forwards. He buried his face in his hands, and it was such a posture of utter defeat that Sirius didn't know what to do. It's okay, he said lamely. I think it's going to be okay. How? Remus asked harshly, lifting his head again. I might as well start packing now. No, don't. Look, he just wants to talk to you about it. He's not going to go straight to Dumbledore or anything. Doesn't that mean something? Remus has already stood up, pushing past him roughly to open his trunk. He began dumping his things into it, completely ignoring his friend. Sirius felt his heart pounding with adrenaline, nervous energy fizzing in his veins. Remus couldn't leave Hogwarts. He couldn't. There wouldn't be a Marauders without him. And how would he listen to David Bowie if Remus was gone? Remus! Sirius grabbed his shoulders. The other boy flinched, but Sirius didn't let go catching his eye and holding it. Listen to me, he said gently. Just wait, okay? Just wait and see what James says. He's your friend. We're marauders, all of us. That's bollocks, Remus said coldly, shoving him away. That's complete bollocks. You two are the marauders. You and him. Me and Peter are just your charity cases. He turned his back, muttering, I'm not that much of an idiot, Black. I'm probably better off back where I belong. Sirius was frozen, stunned, too hurt to speak. If anything, he might have said, anything he might have said died in his throat, leaving a bitter taste on the back of his tongue. Did, did Remus really think that? A cold pit settled into his stomach as he watched his friend pack. What about all the time they'd spent listening to music together? What about the reading? What about last Christmas? Sirius stared, mute as Remus continued tossing his things into his trunk. He knew this relationship was different to the one with James. But that was just because James was a different person. James didn't keep secrets, or disappear on his own, or draw black, or draw back inexplicably whenever Sirius tried to get close to him. How could Remus act like this was his fault? Sirius wanted to say, I thought we were friends. But even his head, but even in his head, that sounded pathetic. Just wait, he said finally. His throat felt tight. He needed to leave. Please just wait and see what he says. Chapter 24 
Second year. Potions. Again. He'd already bunked off Transfiguration, which would mean detention from McGonagall. Although his head was still a mess, Sirius knew he probably couldn't get away with skipping all his lessons, so he reluctantly made his way to his next class. Lucky it was a, luckily, it was a history of magic, which meant he hardly had to pay attention. In his mind, he played Remus's words over and over and over again, on loop. I'm not that much of an idiot, Black. Sirius tried to be responsible. He knew all too well that his friend had a tendency to lash out. It was one of those things they had in common. Remus was probably just scared. He probably didn't mean it. Except, except Sirius still remembered his friend's face as he'd said it. The slight sneer curling his lip, the deep anger in his eyes. It hadn't felt like something drawn purely from the heat of the moment. It had felt like something that had been building, slowly, for a long time. James kept trying to pass him notes behind Professor Bin's back, which didn't improve Sirius's mood. As far as he was concerned, his fight with Remus was entirely Potter's fault. He ignored the notes, pointedly, and remained withdrawn and unresponsive during lunch. Eventually, James threw his hands up and left Sirius to his skulking, whispering, I know you don't like it, but we have to talk to him. Sirius disagreed, but he'd already made his objections very clear, to no effect. Besides, he'd already, besides, he'd warned Remus already, and James was set on his course of action. As classes ended, the three boys headed back to their room. Sirius steeled himself. What the others didn't know was that he had come on his own. As classes ended, the three boys headed back to their room. Sirius steeled himself. What the others didn't know was that he had come to his own private decision. He was not going to let Remus leave Hogwarts. If it meant gagging James until he could knock some sense into the other boy's head, Sirius was firm in his conviction that Lupin had to stay. He had to stick around long enough for Sirius to prove him wrong, to show him that he wasn't a charity case, as if Sirius had the patience for that. And he was a marauder. If his friends had all lost their heads, Sirius would have just forced them to see sense. They were all he had. Now that Reg, well, it didn't matter. James entered first, which, with Sirius close behind. Peter followed after, wringing his hands, edgy and nervous. Remus was sitting on his trunk, but he stood when they walked in, staring them down like he was ready for a fight. Hiya, Remus, James said with a forced cheer. He was standing. They were standing, facing each other. Sirius kept his face blank. The tension was unbearable. Hi, Remus replied warily. How are you feeling? Fine. Look, mate, I'll get right to it, OK? James ran his fingers through his hair, a nervous tick that left it sticking up even more. We've noticed. We all... <laughs> We've noticed, well, we couldn't not notice that you're going away a lot to, to the hospital wing. Every month, pretty much. Something hardened in Remus's face, something sharp and a little mean. For a moment, his eyes flashed dangerously. Sirius felt a shiver run down his spine. Okay. His voice was sullen. The syllables clipped. Yeah, James nodded, ignoring Remus's tone and continued on as if it was any old chat every month around the full moon. He let the words hang there, sucking the air out of the room. Remus released a sharp breath. <sighs> Just say it, James. Are you a werewolf? The words spilled out, running into each other. James looked down as he said it, as if he were embarrassed. Remus's eyes darted to Sirius, who held his gaze. I'm going to prove you wrong, he thought. Just wait. Remus squared his shoulders. Yeah, he stuck his chin out as if he was ready for James to try and punch him. But James just exhaled, silent for a moment before saying, Right. That's it. Yes. I mean, no. I mean, oh, bloody hell. James ran his fingers through his hair again, turning to look back at Sirius. 
as if he expected his friend to save him. You're the one who wanted to have this conversation, Sirius thought, keeping quiet. It's okay, Remus said, voice cold and undying. I'm off. I'll just let McGonagall know. Just let me go and I'll tell McGonagall. James whipped his head around, alarmed. Off? Off where? Back to St Edmund's, I suppose. You can't leave Hogwarts, James exclaimed, taking a half step forward. Sirius blinked. Finally, something they agreed on. I can't stay if everyone knows, Remus snapped. Surprisingly, it was Peter who responded. We won't tell anyone, he said hurriedly. James nodded along, and Sirius sighed quietly, relieved. We won't, James confirmed. The hard look softened a bit as Remus shook his head, perplexed. He stared at them, as if he couldn't quite believe what they were saying, as though he'd never even entertained the option. This isn't a game. Keep the secret or whatever. If people find out, I will have to leave. It could be... It could be worse than that. They might... His voice trailed off as he stared at them helplessly. We won't let it happen, Sirius said firmly, taking a tentative step forward. He turned to look at Peter and James, voice stern. Will we? The other boys shook their heads, wide-eyed. Trust us, James said. Please. He agreed to give them one month, or they agreed to give him one month. It wasn't entirely clear who promised. It wasn't entirely clear who was promising what, or what would happen if any of those promises were broken. The way Sirius figured, Lupin needed Lupin needed time to adjust. He already knew that he could keep a secret, and he'd make sure that James and Peter kept it too. All Remus had to do was stick around, which he did, sort of. He remained physically at Hogwarts, but after James's confrontation, Remus withdrew completely. It was just like last winter, worse even, because now James and Peter contributed to the tension, walking on eggshells whenever they were together. Sirius felt caught in between. He wanted to grab all his friends and shake them. Of course, he could always talk to James. They spent many nights whispering. They spent many nights whispered. They spent many nights in whispered conversation as Sirius tried to convince his friend that they should just all go back to normal and James argued that they needed to give Remus space. Sirius didn't understand what the point of the confrontation had been if they were all going to go on avoiding the elephant in the room. But James insisted that it was best not to inundate the wary boy with questions or force their help upon him. Give him time, he said. Lupin will talk to us once he's comfortable with it. Sirius had doubts about that, remembering their fight. Still, he wasn't sure what to do except take James's advice. So for an entire week, they didn't say a word about what had happened or their monumentous discovery. It drove Sirius mad. He was just about ready to give up and try and force Remus to talk to them. To talk to him, at least. But as luck would have it, he didn't have to. It happened during a potions class. Slughorn wanted them brewing pleasant dream potions, which would have to be accomplished over a number of weeks. You'll need to come back regularly in the evenings to check on your potions progress. I shall be marking you on persistence and attentiveness. To that end, I think it's best if we all pair up, so that you can take it in turns, Slughorn announced. Chatter broke out as students began choosing their partners, moving about the room. James turned to Sirius, grinning, not even needing to ask, and Slughorn raised his voice again. No, no, I've learnt my lesson. He shot the marauders a look. You may not choose the same partners as you had last year. Sirius looked at James and then turned to Remus and Peter. It seemed obvious enough to him he'd be with Remus and James would work with Pete. But Slughorn was still speaking. In fact, I think I shall assign the partners. Sirius groaned. It wasn't enough that Slughorn had to run most of the boring classes, but now he was going to force them to work with partners they didn't even like. 
Sirius supposed he would be paired with the Slytherin. He got his wish when Slughorn split up Mary and Marlene, two Gryffindor girls that were basically joined at the hip, and told them to pair with James and Sirius. Before anyone else could say anything, Mary squealed. I want Sirius! Marlene nudged her friend shyly, and the two of them burst into giggles. Sirius was appalled. He didn't want to work with a girl, especially not one that was giggling and whispering. He slouched over to Mary's table and as Marlene went to take her spot next to James. Mary smiled at him, but just as he... But he grumbled and dropped his book on the table, flipping open the page that Professor Slughorn had written on the blackboard. Oh, Sirius, can you dice the rat tails? Stuff like that skeeves me out. He tried not to roll his eyes. This was why he didn't want to work with girls. They never wanted to get their hands dirty. The rat tails grossed him out a bit too, but he wasn't about to admit that. As he diced, Mary kept up a never-ending stream of chatter. He tuned most of it out, until she said, You're the one that's always playing Bowie in the common room, right? Sirius had just started stirring. He paused. You know Bowie? Mary rolled her eyes, but she was smiling. Duh, everyone knows Bowie. Right, he'd forgotten she was muggle-born. Sirius perked up a bit. Really? What's your favourite song? They began to discuss Ziggy Stardust. Sirius decided that maybe Mary wasn't so bad after all. Before he had time to question her about Bowie's other albums, though, their conversation was interrupted by an explanation from Snape. Ah, oh, look at him! Sirius turned. Severus was a few tables away, speaking loudly enough for about half the class to hear him, while still avoiding Slughorn's notice. He was pointing at Remus, who had his sleeves rolled up. His forearms were crossed with pale scars, some fresher than others. What sort of disease does that? Remus yanked his robes down over his arms flushed and glared at Snape. He'd been paired up with Evans, and to Sirius's surprise, the redhead barked sharply. Shut up, Severus! Why'd you have to be so horrid? Lily, just look! Mind your own business! Sirius swallowed. He needed to say something, to stick up for his friend. But his throat had gone dry. He remembered seeing Remus's scars last year in the Quidditch changing rooms. But Remus had said he'd gotten them at home. Why were there new ones? People weren't supposed to get hurt at Hogwarts. James's voice broke Sirius out of his spiralling thoughts. Oi, Snivellus, what are you saying about our mate? Oh, stay out of this, Potter, Lily groaned. You'll only make it worse. All the shouting had finally drawn Slughorn's attention and he clapped his hands briskly. Silence, please. You're not first years anymore. I should think you're able to concentrate on the task at hand. Quiet settled over the classroom. Sirius turned back to his cauldron, scowling. Next to him, Mary was frowning as well. He's so awful. She leaned in close and whispered. Snape, I mean. I can't believe Lily's friends with him. Sirius grunted in agreement. He really didn't care either way about Lily, but he supposed she and Mary were friends. He acts perfectly civil in front of her, but the second she's not around, he and his friends say the most horrible things, Mary continued, frowning down at the herb she was weighing. I've told her thousands of times, but she just says we don't know him like she does. At that moment, Lily spoke up again, calling out, Oi, Potter! the next table over, James's head snapped up immediately. Glasses fogged from his cauldron steam. Huh? Sirius glanced back at them, briefly curious. But Lily just said, Oh, nothing, and went back to work. Sirius huffed a laugh at his friend's confused expression. Oh, <laughs> Mary giggled, still leaning in close. Does James fun... She didn't get time to finish her question, because at that moment... Snape's cauldron exploded, 
A huge wave of purple foaming bubbles spilled over the brim, dousing Severus and his partner. Sirius burst out into astonished laughter, as did the rest of the class. Snape's face twisted with rage. Oh dear, Slughorn tutted, hurrying over. A bit overeager with the beetle husks, eh, Severus? It wasn't me, Severus shouted, furiously trying to wring out his robes. He did something, he pointed at Remus, who winced away. He must have. This was so obviously true. Snape never made a mistake in potions. He was by far the best student in their year, but Remus was a marauder, and he knew better than to get caught. Did you see? Did you see Mr. Lupin tamper with your potion? No, but... Come now, boy, Slug Slughorn said jovially, tossing his green tea towel to the bubble-covered boy. We all make mistakes, even you. Severus spluttered incoherently, which just set off a new round of laughter. Even Lily's shoulders were shaking as she tried to keep a straight face. After the lesson, the rest of the marauders ambushed Remus in the hallway, whooping and cheering. You did it, didn't you? Brilliant. How'd you do it? You're crap at potions. Remus just grinned silently, refusing to share his secret. His eyes were bright with mischief for the first time in weeks. Didn't I tell you, Sirius proclaimed, heart pounding with joy as he threw his arms around Remus and James. He's still a marauder.